Hello and welcome to the Business of Betting podcast. Today I'm joined by Khan Berry. Khan, thanks for joining me. Before we get into this episode, make sure you follow us on Twitter, at BettingPod, and check out the website, businessofbetting.com. Guest suggestions are much appreciated. This podcast is proudly sponsored by Betfair Proprietary Limited. Betfair operates a betting exchange and is licensed in the Northern Territory of Australia. Residents of Australia can join Betfair by visiting betfair.com.au and support this podcast by using promo code BOBPOD. Please gamble responsibly. So thank you for listening and I hope you enjoy this episode of the Business of Betting podcast. Can't take us through how you got started or involved in in trading. Did you study finance? Did you have a background? Uh, what was your earliest exposure? Um, I don't have a sort of formal academic background um, relating towards betting or anything like that. I started out uh, my working life in McDonald's, <laughs> um, then moved on to the army, and then finally on to trading. Um, so you know, very different route to usual. So did you have a an affinity with, with betting or involved in the horse racing or the sports industries at a young age or did it sort of evolve as you got older? No, not at all. Um, and I mean, I mean, I find myself saying this all the time. I think, I, to be honest, I completely stumbled and fumbled my way um, into it purely by accident um, and it was just something that took my interest. Um, originally, I was sort of introduced to betting via a, a girlfriend's family around Christmas And I felt as though I had to kind of (laughs) do some betting at the time um, because everybody else was. And and at that point in time, I didn't really have a clue at all. So, like I say, I mean, there there was no young interest or, you know, following family members or anything like that. In fact, I was completely against it, which in some aspects I think actually has helped me along the way. So the the first sort of exposure, were you uh, uh, what we call a mug punter or were you losing sort of a lot of your money at that time and just doing it for entertainment? Yeah, I mean, I wasn't I wasn't losing massive amounts of money, but um, initially it was just a purely sort of recreational route in, um, in the betting shop, you know, 20 quid here and there, uh, trying to read a little bit of form in the newspaper, as many people do, I think. Um, and, I, and like I say, I, f- I fumbled my way in. I didn't have any kind of edge or you know advantage over the markets i was purely just going off of what the media told me really more than anything and and following those around me which to be quite honest you know they were in the same position as well so going from the mcdonald's days to the army how actually did you get into trading (laughs) uh yeah sure so um once i found myself in the army um i had plenty of time away so as you can imagine uh, there's plenty of time to sort of read things look around online talk to other people um, and I started to look at, at betting a little bit more in, in that spare time after having the exposure towards betting. Um, and I, I stumbled. I can't remember what came first. There was there was a couple of things around about the same time. I remember reading on a forum thread um, about a piece of software, which I actually use to trade now. And also around about the same time, there was an advert. on. T- I say an advert. It was one of these short clips done by university students. Um, and there was a guy that was actually trading Betfair at the time quite successfully. And, you know, it just, I thought, wow, this really is possible. And so I wanted to pursue it more through that sort of route there. And how long ago was this? Was this in the early days of Betfair or was the market a little bit more mature? No, slightly more mature. I think I missed uh, I missed the uh, the very easy days, as I'm told by other people. Um, <laughs> so I sort of arrived on the scene around about 2008, 2009. Um and I mean, you know, I'm led to believe if you were there at sort of 2005, you could make money standing on your head, as one person said to me. Uh, so I missed that, which was a shame, really. So take us through a normal day in the life of a trader and what your day looks like. Um, sure. I think half the beauty of it, to be honest, Jake, is the fact that there is no set structure. And, and one of the things I really wanted to escape from having um, a traditional job was, you know, following that nine to five grind having a boss breathing down your neck, all those kind of things. So it does vary quite a lot. Um, Typically, I have to be in the office sort of by about 12 o'clock most days. Depends on the time of year. Horse racing is predominantly uh, my focus. Uh, From there, I'll spend the afternoon trading for a few hours at least, maybe have a little bit of break, move on to the evening racing this time of year. Um, And, you know, flicking through different bits of information around that, I guess. 
Uh, and then there's a little bit of upkeep there with the website as well now. So that's pretty much a general day for me. Um, but I like to try and keep it flexible because, like I say, half the benefit for me was um, keeping things flexible and sort of living my life on my terms, if you like. So is it challenging in the sense that you're constantly thinking and adapting and, and problem solving when in your normal days trading? Uh, yeah, a little. I mean, to be honest, I, I t- typically I focus on reading flow within the markets. So it is something that I have to be at the screens for. It's quite active. Um, so outside of the trading period, I'm not sort of um, sat down for hours and hours of time researching uh, different information. So it's intense. I think what I'm trying to say there, it's intense while I'm actually trading. But outside of that, um, no, there's not too much of that. So what do you mean by reading the flow of the market? Take us through that a little bit. Sure, yeah. The, fl- the flow of bets coming in and into the market, basically, um, you know, the fundamental law of sort of support and resistance, if you like, um, as activity picks up in a live show with a horse race, typically. Um, it's the same for the football, I guess, sort of 30 minutes before the start, once the team sheets are released. Um, the majority of money is actually matched within that, that live show window. So um, I'm focusing on all the money as it pours into the market, reading what's happening, um, where the price is likely to move, momentum, sort of sentiment within the market, and then trading that activity. So how do you analyze that information or those bets or what process do you go through to interpret what's happening? Is it in your head somewhere deep down and it works or is it, is it something <laughs> that you can learn or you can explain? Yeah, no, certainly. So, um, so I mean, the, the use of software helps massively with that because obviously you have things like streaming charts, uh, traded volumes, um, you can see money as it hits the market sort of with the instant refresh and stuff like that. I'm sure you're familiar with trading software. So that, that helps me a lot um, to read the, the flow at that point in time. Um, outside of that, uh, there's things like TV feeds. Uh, so obviously, you know, reacting to information that's actually changing live on the screen, particularly like one that's very well known with horse racing is if, you know, a horse is misbehaving down at the start is very much a, a fastest finger first type situation. So, Basically, it's very responsive to, to those kind of things. Most people know what betting is and they'll understand how, you know, the simplicity of, of placing a win bet or something like that. But how would you, in stripping it back, how would you just define what trading is and what it means to you? Sure. Um, so trading is, <laughs> okay, so I would describe trading as the practice of placing two opposing bets on the same outcome to obtain a profit, the profit coming from the margin between the two. Although I'd take it one step further and say uh, that trading um, successfully is when you have a specific um, edge, as it's known, or advantage over the market, over the situation, um, maybe a little bit of extra information that others don't, um, being able to read that flow, for example. And so you can continually um, beat the probability of, you know, of, of the, the movement within the odds to actually t- to obtain that profit. It's not a case of blindly going, hey, I fancy this one, or you know, like, like you get in much of the uh, traditional media feeds, or oh, you know, I've read some form and this horse is in good nick, so the price is going to come in. You know, we're kind of we're not basing it on things like that. We're basing it more on things like emotional elements and reactions within the market, um, market sentiment, as I already mentioned, to ensure that you know we win more often than not because it's impossible to win every single time fair to say that that information you're describing is public but it's just not easily identified yeah i think so yeah it's not easily identified um it does take a little bit of of practice i guess it's like anything a little bit of experience as well um and i think a lot of the time to be honest with you jake one people haven't got the patience for it um or the discipline to maintain that um or two they are looking in the wrong direction altogether, which is something that I've said about in many different places. Um, and I think like, you know, the traditional media feeds, it's understandable how they approach the markets. But I think a lot of the time they have people looking in the wrong direction. So do you ever not trade out or have two sides of the same bet? Uh, no, I do. I do trade out. Yeah, I, I continually trade out. That's that's my approach. I'm quite risk averse compared to to how some other people trade because there's you know it's like like betting there's many different ways to, to skin a cat there's many different ways to trade a market but i always trade out yeah so you mentioned a little bit before about the discipline required how do you maintain that discipline because i'm guessing it's you in front of a number of screens potentially by yourself um trading at, yeah you know, long periods of time <laughs> how do you maintain that 
<laughs> yeah, that's that's the hardest part. <laughs> that is the part I think that most people wrestle with throughout um, any kind of uh, experience within trading, whether they're learning or you know full time or if you've been doing it for a number of years. It's something that's always there. Um, it's sort of sat on your shoulder, and I mean, discipline is is a tricky thing, no matter what you're doing in life. But if you don't maintain it, then you know the markets will consume you there and then. So. Um, it's a very much a personal thing, I think. Knowing what you're doing obviously massively helps, without a doubt, um, because it gives you that extra confidence to maintain that discipline. But uh, beyond that, there's there's a lot of self-control required there with that, yeah, certainly. Tell me about arbitrage. A lot of people that I've listened to talk about arbitrage, and some people dislike it heavily. Others think it's a normal part of the market and it shouldn't be frowned upon. What are your thoughts on arbitrage? Well, yeah, it's just not, I, I would I would go with the second point you made there. It's uh, it's just a part of life. I mean, it doesn't matter whether you're betting or not. People are uh, there's arbitrage going on everywhere, twenty four seven, three six five. Um, it's part of what m- makes the market sufficient. Um, you can't really avoid it. I know the betting industry has like you know a lot of the uh, a lot of the bookmakers and stuff have a very dim view of it, um, but that's just the way things are. It's going to happen. Uh, and, and I wouldn't deter anyone from doing it either because at the end of the day, it's just it's extra money, you know. So can you jump on your soapbox and explain to, to the listeners exactly why you think it's a good thing to have arbitrage in the marketplace and getting towards more efficient pricing? Um, well, I'd say good. I mean, it's just something that is there. It's something that's going to happen. I mean, <laughs> you, ca- you can't really avoid um, people t- taking va- it's taking value at the end of the day. That's all it is. Um, and I think a lot of the people that complain about things like that are maybe bookmakers that are providing prices. And the answer is, you know, you just need to have a more efficient price if that's a problem for you. If your prices were efficient, then you, you wouldn't be experiencing that. So um, it's just, just more a case of, look, hey, I just think everybody should take what they can from the market at the end of the day um, and, and look after number one because at the end of the day, that's, that's what you need to do. Yeah. No, I'm curious as to how, if at all, you need bookmakers or utilize them in terms of your day-to-day are they something that's a valuable tool just for market intelligence or are they no something you yeah no, to bet with sure no so so with I don't, I don't use bookmakers um i think to be honest any bookmaker i've ever tried any anything with really i've been either restricted limited or um or banned there and then um some in sort of less than 24 hours so that's not really an option in terms of information um Obviously, their live televised feeds are quite useful. <laughs> Outside of that, uh, bookmakers' prices are obviously trailing exchange prices, so there's not really any, any additional information there for me to be had. Maybe the odd situation, um, sort of extreme events or course bookmakers sometimes responding uh, to very large bets and stuff like that. There's just as a little topper on top of you know uh, some previous indicators or opinion that I may already have within the market, that's kind of nice to have, but they're not an essential tool for me to use now. Is that commonplace for traders who are you know betting both sides of a bet and often getting a, a pretty good price if they're going to take a small margin out of that race or that bet? Is it normal for them to be shut down and restricted pretty quickly as opposed to the the semi-professional sports better, let's say? You mean in terms of with, with a bookmaker? Yeah. Um, yeah, to be honest, I mean, my personal view is uh, I, I don't see any other way around it. I mean, if somebody's taking value, you're going to get close. That's just, that's the, I mean, in 2018 now, uh, that's how the world works. I don't think there's bookmakers that sort of take opinion and take big positions. And if they do, they're probably not the best bookmakers um, because well the, the exchange is rule <laughs> uh, wisdom of the crowd is there and you can't really argue with it so i think that those days where bookmakers took big bets and sort of played the punt are, are, are gone to be quite honest whether they admit that or not at this point i think that's gone what are your options then you've obviously got betfair everyone's aware of betfair and it's been around for a fair bit of time now but what other options are there in terms of being a trader and and going onto exchanges to to get an, enough volume down over time enough you know trades to be able sure. to survive sure yeah um i mean survival is not really a problem because of the amount of money that passes through the markets but uh betfair is obviously the main port of call not necessarily because of commission or anything like that um, and there's the premium charge to contend with as well but they have the lion's share of liquidity they have the most money that passes through them so betfair is obviously the number one choice beyond that you've got uh, a few other exchanges you've got uh, betdac um 
markets possibly i don't really use them and there's matchbook as well but their commission structure is different so i think primarily for traders of, of my kind at least because like i say there's so many different so it's such a broad topic um it's bet fair or bet dac and is the holy grail just having high volume and liquidity in the markets to be able to have confidence that you are going to be able to bet on both sides um well, yeah, I mean, you, you can't you can't trade without liquidity because you're just uh, exposing yourself to unnecessary risk. Um, the less liquidity is, um, the, the more you sort of uh, reduce your edge, if you like, a lot of the time. It depends what you're doing, though. Like I say, there's different ways to skin a cat. Some people prefer to operate in lower liquidity markets where there's larger spreads within the book, um, and they can sort of take chunks out of the market like that, although I would suggest that's probably not very high stakes at all, which again limits it so a lot of the time you find traders such as himself prefer high liquidity horse racing stuff like that close to the start within those live shows that are previously mentioned on an exchange where there's a good amount of liquidity like betfair so does that mean you're focusing largely on sort of you know saturdays for racing and things like that uh, yeah, Saturdays are usually quite good for turnover. Saturdays are, uh, are the best, obviously, with the um, additional TV coverage as well. Um, although the, the day-to-day stuff, there's uh, there's plenty to, to choose from there, and there's still plenty of liquidity to, to turn over. You might want to avoid some of the races, sort of like either end of the card sometimes. Typically, maybe Friday night at Dundalk in Ireland. It's, it's typically very unliquid and not very good. Um, and it's, it's a case of you don't want to chase away your edge trying to exit a position. And when there's a lack of liquidity, that's typically what the problem is if you're on too large a stake. So within a market, are you, do you have a preference uh, you know, to trade someone who's a favorite or second favorite as opposed to a 10 or 15 to 1 chance? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I tend to operate around about sort of um, 3 to 1 to 8 to 1 mark. Um, so that's kind of like that middle ground. That's where I prefer. And as long as there's liquidity there, then I'll, I'll be interested in that. Favorites aren't really something I focus on. Um, I prefer to try and focus where the opportunity is rather than pinning it to something like, you know, a favorite or a horse that is four to one, for example, because just because a horse is four to one or a favorite doesn't necessarily mean that there's um, opportunity there. So I'll, I'll kind of go where there's um, I, a lot of the time, I think it's important for traders to remember at the end of the day, what you're trading is money within the market, but behind that money is people. So one of the things that I typically focus on is sort of kind of like human emotion and fear and the unknowns within the market. So I'll focus where the opportunity is, is what I'm trying to say there. Um, and But at the same time, it has to have that added um, liquidity and, and opportunity to get bets through the market with a limited amount of risk. Can you sort of tell where the opportunity is going to sit uh, looking at a market maybe 20 minutes out and thinking, okay, I can see here that this 6 to 1 or 8 to 1 chance is where I'm going to focus or is it sort of evolve as you get from 20 minutes out to, to 2 minutes out, let's say? Yeah, a lot of the time uh, it's, it's easy enough to anticipate the areas there's likely to be something, but then um, the follow-up to that is as it happens um, and is, you know, the things like the order flow within the market. So... Typically, there's certain situations which react more than others. Um, and a lot of the time, that's understanding the different limitations and characteristics of the actual situation. So if I, going back to what I was saying previously earlier, um, a lot of the time within horse racing, for example, people uh, have developed this kind of way of thinking that they need to focus on the horse's form or how it's behaved previously. And that's not something that I would focus on. I'd be focusing more on a case of, you know, is it a handicap race or a potentially a maiden race where there's very little information about the horses and how is the market going to respond to that? And then once the liquidity arrives and the market starts to develop, I can, you know, I can develop a more accurate opinion of what's actually happening there and then. So if I told you you had to only trade favourites under $2.50 for the next three weeks, how would your approach change, if at all, or are they just a a commodity within the market and you'll approach it exactly the same way? Uh, I think the answer to that would be I would probably just trade less. Um, I would I would still certainly do it, but I would just have to refine my approach more um, and be a little bit more selective, uh, I guess, because it's obviously concentrated to that small area within the market. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of the time people suffer from overtrading as well. Um, and it's probably the same within gambling and overbetting. Um, so it's important to pick out, you know, those low, low-hanging fruit, if you like, as I like to call it, 
um, the opportunities that are easier. And then, I mean, it costs you nothing to sit back and, and watch. So I think I'd do that a lot more. Rethink the way you see sport. Every action or play can be represented by a series of numbers. When you analyze this data, patterns begin to emerge. If you follow these patterns and develop systems, you can play the game within the game. Betfair.com.au. Gamble responsibly. So I'm curious about what type of sort of pre-trading work that you need to do. It doesn't sound like a typical sports or a horse racing better would spend hours poring over the race form. What type of analysis or preparation work are, is required for a, a trader like yourself? Sure. Um, a lot. A lot there's a lot of experience from, from what I've done over time, which obviously is a massive bonus, but I'll be looking more at things like, uh, you know, do horses play up going into the starting stalls? Uh, if they do, which horse is that? So I can keep an eye on that as that situation develops when they are loading the horses because there'll be a snap opportunity there and then. And obviously, you know, fastest finger first, that's the person that gets all the money. So um, I want to be that person, basically. So I'll be looking at characteristics like that rather than, um, as we said, her horses form. Um, things potentially like uh, some trainers are renowned for having huge gambles. And so if, I mean, I don't know if you're aware of Barney Curley in the past, uh, markets used to respond and be really quite wild if people thought money was going down on a Barney Curley horse. And so I would be kind of looking and rese researching for that kind of information rather than a horse's form. You know, is there a Barney Curley horse in this race? Because if there is, I'm really interested in on what's going to happen within the market because it's going to affect the whole market depending on what happens. Yeah, a friend of mine mentioned Mr. Curley this week actually, and I was, I was looking into it the other day. It's, it's, uh, it's a yeah. good point. So do you have to keep all that information yourself i'm i'm guessing no race books in the world are gonna have that type of information which is probably a good thing for you how do you how do you keep all that um within your own database sure yeah i definitely um i keep track of stuff like that uh and there's another thing that i focus on sometimes is how horses start at the beginning of the race so um there's various trackers online i don't know if you've used any yourself but um, there's different email services which are free. Uh, I think At The Races has one as well. There's gg.com and a couple like that. But basically, you put in the horse's name and they email you the day before to say it's running. So you can add a note to that as well. So I use a couple of those. Okay, no, that makes sense. I guess you're probably a good person to ask. A lot of people get into trading or betting because they, they love horse racing or greyhounds or even sports. They're mad sports fans. So they think they can win long term you sound like you're not on that end of the scale take us through your thoughts on whether you need to have a passion for the the actual sport itself yeah i think uh, it's a tricky one because i mean no matter what you do in life you need to have a passion right if you, if you don't have a passion you're not going to see it through um if you find something dull and boring you're not going to you're not going to go the long term which learning to trade is rarely a short term uh, thing to do so you, you need to have the passion to last in that sense but in terms of being being a fanatic, I often say I think that's the worst possible thing that could happen. I mean, we've got the, the World Cup starting just now, um, and you see some of the comments on social media. Obviously, people are excited. And in terms of betting and trading and making informed decisions, that is just like an absolute no-no as far as I'm concerned. I think having uh, the kind of background that I have coming into it, not being a fanatic, you know, following certain horses or you know being interested in certain teams it's a huge benefit to me because i'm allowed to i'm allowed myself to kind of make a colder uh, decision on what i think is actually happening rather than there being any kind of uh, driving passion which is um, changing my behavior yeah no that makes sense that makes sense i wanted to ask about the world cup what impact is the world cup given i'm guessing it's very high volume and some of the numbers that you hear in the media about what's going to be bet and i'm guessing what's going to be traded is is obviously very high how how would someone approach the world cup do you sit down for a couple of weeks and and think about a strategy for it or is it this like you mentioned it's just another race it's another sporting event it's another match yeah well the world cup's massive and to be honest with you jake i don't really um do, do anything with football so um it's not really one for me it's definitely interesting just to watch from a from a recreational point of view but i, I won't be trading the world cup so um, that's not something I'll sit down. I would assume people that are trading the World Cup will do stuff like that. 
Um, but it's it's more interesting in the sense of it's going to take money away from other sports, funny enough. So in terms of horse racing, there'll actually be less money while the World Cup's on, turned over in various events. So I'll be kind of covering up in those areas and, and trying to limit the amount of risk that I potentially take in horse racing markets while the World Cup's on. So take us through how the industry, the trading industry, has sort of evolved. It sounds like you missed the early days where it might have been relatively easy to turn a profit. <laughs> but from, I guess, the, the times when you began, and obviously bookmaking itself has gone through a bit of a, an evolution with regards to risk management, how has the trading industry evolved from your perspective uh, over that time? Sure. Um, I mean, obviously, bookmaking has changed a hell of a lot. And I think there's probably still a lot more to change as yet. Um, the horse racing obviously, obviously my main focus and I think that that hasn't actually changed that much over the years really um, the way it's viewed anyway at least um, but in terms of trading it's I feel like it's kind of like a niche within the betting industry that never really kind of escaped or got too much exposure and I think a lot of that comes down to the fact that the bookmakers sort of pull the strings on most stuff um, but it's still, it's still a bit of an unloved part of the betting industry in a way um, and it is a select group of people, I guess. It's quite niche. So, yeah. What do you think is going to happen with regards to the bet fairs, the the bet DAX, or these type of uh, exchanges into the future? Do you think they're going to they're looking at an upswing and they'll be more positively adopted, or do you think they'll still fit within that niche? Yeah, I mean, the fact that there's more of them now than there was previously um, dilutes the overall situation. You would have thought. Um, I think long term, though, surely uh, the betting industry in general has to move more towards exchanges. I think a lot of people expected it to happen sooner, uh, and it probably was with Betfair in the earlier days, but then obviously they developed their own sports book. Um, where it goes long term, I guess nobody actually really knows, but I suspect that it w- things should, in theory, move further towards exchanges as you know technology gets better, people understand the situation more, uh, different generations come through. That rather than sort of like propping up the the bar in the betting shop with a betting slip, uh, as as that kind of moves moves away, and you get you know these younger kids coming through, are more technologically advanced and understanding where the value is and and stuff like that, then I, I would have thought that would have an impact over sort of the next five to ten years of the betting industry, and hopefully we'll see more people on exchanges. So take us through your approach to money management. Obviously, it's a critical component, and a lot of people that will bet professionally talk about you know their approach with kelly or their different staking plans and not wanting to overbet. and there's many components that go into the idea of money management what are the core principles that sort of prop up your approach to money management i always do say that i think it's important that you stake in line with the potential opportunity that's in, in front of you there rather than um again i think this is one of those things that people approach from the wrong angle um, they, they look as though every opportunity is the same and therefore they have a staking plan around that, but they're not at the end of the day. So, I mean, if you're <laughs> kind of like to make an extreme example, if you were betting on a horse race in running and the jockey has been thrown off at the fence, then you should be betting your whole bank, you know, to, to, to lay to lay that horse. It, it makes no sense to have some kind of staking plan around um, a generic situation because the situations aren't generic at the end of the day. So you kind of have to scale in line with the opportunity. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I guess as a follow-up question, what are the major mistakes that you've seen or even have made um, previously that you've sort of stopped and, and are key critical things that you don't want to be doing? Yeah, of course. Um, I've done them myself and I think a lot of other people do it as well. And that is the biggest, my biggest bugbear has to be approaching every single race in the same um, approach, the same method, using similar stakes and, and trying to get the same result from every situation because quite frankly, every situation is not the same. Um, aside from that, well, I guess in conjunction with that is overtrading um, and even undertrading as well, I guess, um, because if you're overtrading a situation, um, you're just reducing your own, uh, your own margin. <laughs> you're actually decreasing your own edge. So I think that's that's the biggest pitfalls, which is hard because it ties in with sort of human emotion and greed and how people are viewing the situation. And obviously everybody's getting into trading or betting because they want to make money, right? So um, the the natural uh, thing to do is to try and push the boundaries. But actually, a lot of the time, it's the worst thing you can actually do if if, if the situation doesn't permit it. Have you seen a an array or a wide varying amount of approaches when it comes to this type of thing, or are you seeing the successful people? 
sticking to this type of approach? Uh, I think successful people typically stick to to their approach um, in terms of that. But I've met a lot of people over the time. I've been invited to different events um, by some of the bigger firms. and that. I've met some interesting people that operate in ways that I wouldn't have even thought of. Um, and although they haven't told me exactly what they're doing, I mean, nobody would. Um, you can just tell that you're kind of almost doing the opposites at times um, and still kind of making it work. So I think there's... There's just heaps and heaps of ways to make money from betting. Um, some some are more scalable than others, obviously. Some are more consistent than others. But th- there's many different ways to skin the cat as such. But I think it's important once you find something that works is just to sort of drill down, as it were, on, on that partic- particular thing, stick to it, and then just work out slowly from there rather than um, this kind of shotgun approach of trying to find lots of different angles at the same time. It, it makes no sense logically. And I guess one more question on this topic. Has your approach changed much over time? Have you had evolutions or revolutions of your strategy in terms of money management and bankroll management, or has it been pretty consistent all the way along? Yeah, it's certainly developed. It's, it's always been a, a, a developing um, d- developing thing, um, particularly I think a, a long time I, like, I made a lot of mistakes early on, and it was fine because obviously my, my profits were outweighing my mistakes. But uh, it's important to sort of develop what you've got there and evolve to the situation. And I think early on, um, I was probably over trading. I was over trading and I was making some of those mistakes that we've already previously spoke about. So losing periods, everyone has them, whether you're a trader, sports better or otherwise. How do you how do you deal with them? Have you got anything you put in place to try and um, to cope with them and, and potentially limit them or take time away? What What are some of the things that you can be doing or you can sort of advise others that they can consider doing sure I've done different because a lot of the time it's not even the actual mistakes it's the further mistakes that then come out of those previous mistakes as a result of your own emotional reaction so um on a, on a kind of micro level on a daily trading level if i have you know this foolish mistake that i like that was ridiculous i can't believe i just did that obviously you can't undo that you can't correct that which is something that people are often looking for which is quite ridiculous um so what i will do is i will just completely break the cycle break my routine at that point in time get up out of my chair out of the office uh, maybe even go for a walk make a cuppa it's become it's become easier over the years to deal with this kind of situation and i remember very early on i used to get so angry when i made such mistakes but um the best thing you can do is kind of like bring everything back to ground zero get out of the room and just level off really and what about when you do have those periods obviously it must be a hit to your pride and and you need to have some humility are you are you able to put that to one side and just say look the way the way the mathematics world suggests you're gonna have these runs and you just have to deal with it and cope with it yeah on on some level it's just variance i guess i mean it's probability but um like i say i mean with my personal approach and the way i skim the markets i I tend not to really have those um lulls for any kind of any kind of time um worst case it'll be sort of like for a day or maybe two days Uh, so it's not really a huge issue for me which i'm very glad of because i think everybody deals with the situation differently but i just would find it too hard if it was going on for weeks i think i would really just get fed up with it yeah absolutely so one last question before i let you go Uh, you mentioned you'd been to a few events and spoken to some people. What other things can you be doing to access good information or speak to the right people? Or are there, are there books you can read? Is there content that you sort of consume to make sure you're up to speed with what's happening in the marketplace? Sure. Um, I mean, it's always good to talk to people, but then the problem is you never know whether you're talking to the right people. Um, and obviously, learning the wrong things is just as bad as not learning at all. Uh, so it's good to kind of like if you can develop a couple of people who are also progressing and sort of feed off of them and, and help each other out vice versa I've actually produced a couple of things myself so we've got the website calmberry.com you've probably seen it and there's a couple of bits of information on there but if you stick typically to uh, the the sources that are kind of like endorsed by the bigger stuff within the industry then that's probably the best route to take I mean for example Betfair's got a learning directory and they've got a few bits on there as well, and some books on there. So you're probably best to, to sort of stick to verified sources, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Because <laughs> if you kind of go over to Twitter and look at the million and one Twitter tipsters or, you know, the, the 200 Betfair traders on Twitter, then chances are, you know, obviously some of them are making money and some of them are doing very well. Um, and that's great. But a lot of the time you're going to go around in circles. 
um, not knowing the wood from the trees. Yeah, so I guess that's probably why you wrote Betfair Trading Made Simple, and, and tell us about yeah. that. Yeah, sure. So that was a, a fairly recent release. It's an entry-level book just for people that are just getting into trading, really. Um, it'll give you all the the ground basics and foundations that you need to get going. Um, it, it kind of it won't give you any golden goose or magic bullet. Um, it will certainly put you in the right direction, though, and have you thinking in the right uh, the right angles if you're if you're to succeed over the longer term. So that was just basically I thought I'd do that because it was a really solid uh, starting base and there wasn't anything out there to already provide that as well, obviously, at a very low cost. And one final question. If I'm about to start trading day one and I've just read your book and I'm going to sit down and I've bought three laptops and I'm, I'm ready to get into it, what's the one or two things that I need to know as a first timer about to embark on a hopefully a successful trading career? Okay. Uh Okay, so the first thing is to realize on day one before you've even started that your own personal interaction is far bigger than you actually realize um, and your own sort of like own self-awareness, if you like, is huge. Um, so to kind of wholeheartedly accept that on day one would put you at a massive benefit. Um, and then secondly, it would be to uh, not dive in feet first. I think everybody's just like diving in feet first. They're looking for this short-term um, answer and the reality is if you set out from the start looking for a longer term answer you'll get that shorter term answer a lot quicker if that makes sense um, so I would say prepare for the longer term and be as self-aware as possible on day one and just work slowly from there working outwards awesome that's great Khan I really do appreciate your time and all of your insights today uh, thanks for coming on the show no, brilliant thanks for having us Jake